Boom blast. It's another short episode of the challenge. Spies, lies, and allies. How do we feel about these short episodes? Well, I want to I want to talk about the short episodes, but first I want to okay. introduce myself. I'm John Chidley Hill. And I am Sheldon Alexander with the Fresh Cut. Shouts to my guy John who allowed me to to sneak off to the barbershop. Like we were trying to figure out, people don't know sometimes, you know, how we juggle the schedule around, trying to figure out when we're going to record. And John said, hey, might be a little later today. And I'm like, ooh, let me see if I can get a haircut. <laughs> and boom, clean cuts. Uh, shout out to Clean Cuts, the official barbershop of You Killed It. But also, <laughs> yes. I don't think people want to know how this podcast gets made because... It's sometimes an ugly process. We look good, but the way it gets made is not so good. Okay. I want, I'm so glad you brought up the hour-long episode thing, because I was curious about it. Mm-hmm. From a production standpoint, you've got our insight. Okay. This is two weeks in a row where we had hour-long episodes. After seasons of generally 90-minute episodes, what's going on? Because like, the business side of me is like, they're getting less commercial time. Mm -hmm. And this is probably MTV's biggest moneymaker. I don't know. Ridiculousness does pretty well. And hold on. Can our American listeners tell me something? Because I really want to know. Does ridiculousness come on all the time in the States as well? Or is that just a Canadian thing? No, it's there too. What we get that they don't get is we get the corner gas cartoon and they don't. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. There's, there's someone listening. They're like, what's corner gas? But anyways. So, um, hold on. I have I have more to say about corner gas. Oh, First time anyone's ever said that. Wow. I, I think you need talking- to start by explaining what corner gas is, because I'm going to assume that most Americans have no idea what corner gas is. Well, I will. I will, as part of this anecdote, friend of the show, Marie, from The Challenge. Okay. She... Uh, she posted somewhere on social media complaining about how often they show ridiculousness. Okay. And so I messaged her. I don't know. We had some sort of interaction where I was like, yeah, well, we have reruns of Corner Gas. And she's like, what the fuck is Corner Gas? <laughs> so for those of you who are not familiar with Corner Gas, it's a Canadian sitcom based on the... Uh, comic stylings of stand-up comedian brett butt that is his real name and it's set in a fictional saskatchewan town called dog river where he plays the manager of a gas station in this small town and it's just like him and his two employees shooting the shit in the small town and his dad who owned the gas station originally is always coming in to like give him grief Mm -hmm. and his mom is also a big character and he has sort of a flirtation with this local woman uh well so sorry major plot point she's from toronto so she's an untrustworthy city person but she moves to dog river saskatchewan (laughs) to open up a diner that's like attached to the gas station yeah. And then there's two characters that are uh, the two local RCMP officers. And that's, uh, I think that's the main, ca- I think I got everyone in the main cast. That I, sounds like, like a South Park bit of what Canadian television would be like. Well, the or like a family guy bit. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> for sure. The incredible thing is, so Corner Gas is on through the like early to mid 2000s. And then it got canceled. I'm sure you remember Sheldon. Big time finale. People cried in the streets. Oh, and... I, I tuned in for sure. <laughs> and then in like the past five years, they came out with a corner gas cartoon show. So it's like the same voice actors as the original show. And like, guys, no one missed corner gas. <laughs> like, I'm probably the biggest corner gas fan around. And like, I'm not that into it. I can't say that I know anybody that watches Corner Gas. And I think I've probably watched Corner Gas fan. 
in total in my life, I've maybe watched five minutes of Corner Gas, like total. I've probably watched 20 or 30 episodes. That's incredible. Um, I don't even know how we got on the oh ridiculousness. Ridiculousness. Ridiculousness is the only thing that airs on MTV every single day, and then Corner Gas in Canada. Um, so the hour episodes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> We're off the rails like two minutes into this pod, but I think the people need us off the rails because what's going on in the show. Although this episode wasn't bad. This episode wasn't bad. I can't even. This episode is better than last week, for sure. For sure. So here's what I think. And it depends on what ends up happening the next coming weeks, right? That will tell us exactly what's going down. If they have a string of one hour episodes, it means that the season wasn't that good. And they got into the edit suite and realized, oh, we got to start like spacing this stuff out because we don't have enough. So then they start making one hour episodes. But for what we're looking at right now, if I'm just talking about this episode and the episode before, at first, I thought the reason why they split up the two episodes was because Emmy was going to lose and they didn't want the Emmy episode where they were trying to push all of her music. Right. Mm. And be like, hey, here's this pop star buy her music. She's awesome. I thought they didn't want to have that episode be the same episode where she loses and goes home. Right. Cause that's kind of a bad sales pitch. That's what I thought. But now that I see these two episodes, I think that they probably just had enough for maybe two hours, but not the full last week, hour and a half this week, hour and a half. You, you know, know what? what I mean? I- I do know what you mean. And listening to you like deep dive, something else occurred to me. And we'll talk about this further on this episode of You Killed It, but they've lost three cast members unexpectedly. Oh, yeah, that's true. Right. And like, so they lost Nam, who they replaced with Ed. So I guess like numbers remain the same in that Mm -hmm. respect. But there is. I can't even remember her name, but Josh's original partner who got booted from the show for saying oh, inappropriate Michaela? things. Ma- oh. No, not Michaela. What was her name? I don't even remember. Uh, she was barely on because she they like gave her the old D edit, and then oh, and then of course this episode we're going to get into it, but Fessy gets eliminated. But then also, um, what's my guy from Survivor with the red hair? He got hurt. And Anissa got hurt. Anissa got hurt. Yeah, people so are dropping five like flies. people that like bounced early. So like that's that is a lot of drama sort of out the door. Yeah. No, for sure. For sure. And I think that plays a role in it for sure. Cause you you are now adjusting on the fly, right? You had things kind of laid out, maybe in terms of twists and turns of how the season was gonna go. But now like some of the drama's been taken out because the way the show initially was intended to be, you go down with your partner, but maybe part of the drama would have been, well, they're selecting a guy from one group and then a girl from another group. And now you kind of taking that off the table, right? Especially when, you know, Esther just doesn't have a partner. So they know that it's going to be a female elimination. You're removing a bunch of the drama and a bunch of the um, deliberating or politicking that would be going on in the house. That's now gone. So just a lot less stuff to show. Then add in, they're not trying to go heavy on the party, crazy drunkenness either. We've seen that, right? It's been toned down. We know, as I talked about on, I don't remember now because it's a blur and my I'm scatterbrained. Was it last week or a couple weeks ago when we were talking about the Amanda and Fessy thing, right? And yeah. how much... Amanda was talking on IG live about how like her and Fess were joking around about how, Oh, they didn't even show them hooking up in the bunk beds and how much like they almost broke the bunk beds and they're joking around, but still like, we didn't even really see that. No. Right. Like, so we'll get, we'll get to the Fessy stuff for sure, but there's just a lot going on here. And maybe, maybe this is also just a test run to see, Cause I'm still thinking there's a world where they start putting the challenge on like CBS and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. So I, I'm that's you, better I, suited to be an hour. 
I think I think that's going to happen. I I think it because like it's increasingly obviously the format is like uh, reality TV all stars basically. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I and they've definitely toned down the sexual content, and I could see it easily transitioning to CBS. One thing I w- I wanted to point out was. I don't know. Do you watch the previously on, like the little preamble to every episode? Yeah. It was a good reminder about the pizza fight. And this is so, I, I don't know. I just find this interesting. So everyone's drunk. Yeah. Amber's pizza gets eaten by someone else. Tori seeing an opportunity shouts, Fessy ate your pizza knowing that those two have beef. Mm-hmm. It just like watching back the like sort of the Cole's notes, it's sort of I found it interesting that Fessy never actually said, Amber, I didn't eat your pizza. And I'm not saying did, that though. did he? If he I did, think he like, did. I didn't I didn't hear him. Maybe I gotta go back and watch last week's episode. But it just like he did so little to diffuse the fight. Which is partly why he's messy fassy because he he doesn't it's not that he doesn't back down, he just doesn't address other people's upset ever. And like we're certainly gonna talk about that tonight, but see, I go the other way. I think that he did there was an acknowledgement when it originally happened that like, come on, Amber, you know I didn't eat I didn't take your pizza. Mm-hmm. Right? Like I think there was that acknowledgement very early on. I think the the thing that really stood out to me was Fessy is smiling throughout like the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, you know, the moment I was about to say something that I definitely should not say on the podcast, but (laughs) I'll tiptoe around and self edit myself live and on the fly. But you know, when you're in those moments when like you're around people who are drunk and you're not drunk. Yeah. So it's a little um, different. I'll say. Yeah. So you're taking them in and you just know that you're playing a different game at the, in the moment than they are. And Fessy just had like this smirk on his face the entire time because you have to remember he's just chilling. Meanwhile, everyone else, it's nighttime. You could tell they're, they're getting it in. And that's the part that was kind of weird to me to go back and watch and be like, Oh, okay. This is also really weird because there's a line where, you being the sober one, you know, there's a line between, okay, I get it. They're drunk. And then, okay, this is really annoying. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where he got to, right? Yeah. That actually brings me to a question I had in my notes for you, Sheldon. And I don't know where, where I sit on this. If you're on the challenge, like you, Sheldon Alexander, you get invited. They're like, we're going to show this podcast or what time it is come on the challenge would it be to your advantage to be sober the entire time yeah definitely so definitely because i think like you know i think what ends up happening is people begin to manipulate that against you right and also like do you want to be and it also depends on are you talking about me now Are you talking about me at 23? (laughs) Because that guy definitely should not be on camera when um, when the Remy's in the system, as uh, noted poet Sean Carter once famously said. Right. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I don't think I just don't think that's a good idea just because like what does it actually benefit? What's the benefit up to that? The there's two benefits that I can see. Okay. The first is I do think it's important that you get along with everyone in the house. Mm-hmm. And there's something like you don't want to ostracize yourself. And like there sure. will inevitably be, inevitably be someone that says, hey, what the fuck? Like, why aren't you drinking? Like you, you want to be a joiner, but you don't want to join that hard. But there's and a the line. Other, there's a line for sure. And the other thing is exactly what you're describing with Festy. You don't want to be sober 
when all these people are are like super drunk like you don't yeah. want to be the one in bed <laughs> trying to sleep when they're all going nuts like that would get old in a hurry it's what also home girl's name on all stars and drinking lets you blow off some steam yeah what was home girl's name on all stars arissa yeah right like no i totally know what you're saying i think there's a line where you can drink just not you know the cash money motto is to drink till you throw up. Is that a little Wayne line or did I make that up? That's a nope. little Wayne line, isn't it? We're going to drink until we throw up. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's a line. The it is a line. The cash money motto is to drink till you throw up. I'm pretty sure that's a thing. Anyways, my point is that there's a line between where you can just chill, have a couple drinks, have a one, two, maybe you're feeling nice. Then you chill, right? You know, when I was in grad school. Uh-oh. I was uh, I was pretty I was pretty poor, okay. And I also I knew I had to get along with my classmates, including friend of the show Danny Black. Hey, and I developed a personal system where I would go out with my classmates for drinks, like whenever mm-hmm. there was like a big. And I my personal rule is I would or was I would have two drinks, okay. and then I would leave. Okay. Because that way I wasn't spending too much. And like, okay. you're not pissing anyone off. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, no one can say, like, oh, John never comes out with us. Because I would be out. Yep. And like, two drinks is like 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Maybe I'd have like a meal. It's a good solid time. And then I'd go home. So, like, definitely part of the crew, but not getting into the drama. I like it. I like the it. Move. Getting into the drama, though, there's a lot going on after Fessy shoves Josh. Things do not cool down. No. So one thing that I'm not sure about, and maybe I should watch a super slow-mo replays over and over again, but did this actually start with Josh? You know when you do like the, and I'm going to act this out on on the, the video for people to see. So, hey, another reason in case you guys aren't watching the YouTube version of the podcast, you know, to see our handsome faces and the fresh haircuts, by the way, and the zaddiness of Mr. John Chidley Hill. But my point is here, as I act this out, you know, the, and I'll try to do my best to describe it too, for our audio only listeners, but, um, you know, you do the two finger. We've talked about this before, right? The two finger, like disrespect point in someone's face. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? My question is, did Josh do that to Fessy first and like maybe graze his face, graze his nose just before Fessy then retaliated with the actual full on contact? Again, I'm not saying that Josh like, you know, actually like dissed Fessy, gave him a full on like rude boy (laughs) poke with the two. You know, you know what I'm saying? I'm not saying he gave him the full fledged that. But was there a little bit of contact? I don't know. Uh, I think so. And, and Josh was definitely physically the aggressor. Like mm-hmm. he was in Fessy's face. For a long Fessy time. was pretty, was much more calm and willing to take a step back. Mm-hmm. Had his wits about him more. Fessy obviously crossed the line. Should not have shoved Josh. No. Um, but I can see how Josh mentally, emotionally pushed him to that point. Oh, Um, Josh was going off. This was the thing, right? Josh standing on the couch singing, you're going home, you're going home to the point where Amanda's the one being the, the peacekeeper. I thought that was hilarious. I mean, Amanda, I'm going to say Amanda and Esther and Casey, Okay. The the women most associated with this, by and large, had their shit together. So mm-hmm. last episode, we saw Esther threw a drink in Amber's face. And then Amber does the whole, like, I'm a woman, you're a woman. We should never disrespect each other like that sort of speech. And Esther apologizes. And in confessional, Esther says, you know, I shouldn't have done that. I still don't like Amber. Like, I still think <laughs> she's fake. Yeah. But I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. And 
But then Josh, after bouncing up and down on the couch, which was like he l- looked like a literal child. Yeah. Which Matt I think Josh telling, came back out today. Yeah. He tells everyone to vote in Fessy and Esther. And then people are like, uh, you were just making out with Esther like an <laughs> hour ago. Like, what's wrong with you? He's like, oh, not Esther, not Esther. You could see him catch himself. And then Casey arrives on the scene and Josh tells Casey to pick between him and Fessy. And this is where I like Casey. I'm liking Casey more and more. She says that Josh and Fessy are putting a huge target on their backs. And it's so interesting to me how much Josh cannot calm himself down when he's upset and like i don't want to get all psychological Mm -hmm. but it really says something about someone's upbringing when they can't calm themselves down and they're like a full adult because soothing yourself is something you learn from parent parental figures so it's Interesting. interesting how quickly josh i mean he he was acting literally like a child like i don't think i'm unfair saying that So I go the other way with this because where I go with Josh here is the fact that I believe that this was a Josh that we've been complaining about for seasons and seasons and seasons past where he realizes, oh, this is my moment. This is my episode where I can guarantee Mm. that I'm the focal point of the episode. So I'm going to go over and above and do too much to make sure that I am the focal point of this episode. That's where I thought a lot of this was going was going on. I don't know if and I think then he just takes it too far, right? Like he switches gears. He's in that mode. I'm making good TV. I'm making reality TV. I'm going to be in the trailer. And then he's just going off and then like going too far. And that's where you get the whole him on top of the couch, which remember him on the bar a couple seasons ago when he yep. was arguing with uh, was it Swaggy? Yeah, Swaggy. Right? Um then that's when you get him just blurting out, throw in Fessy and Esther, and then reality kicks in. It's like, oh, wait, no, I actually like Esther. I just think that's where all that stuff comes from. Um, then he even tried to fight with Amanda, who was really just trying to get him to pay attention and get him to realize, like, dude, they just completely just manipulated you, right? And she was making the most sense. And it was funny because it's Amanda. And, you know, if you listen to this pod, I rep Amanda hard. She was just like, uh, when Josh started yelling, she just does the, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're not going to pull this with me. <laughs> like, I'm not the one you're going <laughs> to. You can do all this stuff with everyone else. But you don't want you don't want this with me. Like, this is not what's going down. But she went on to explain. And she's right. Tori and them just Tori and Corey just manipulated you. And you think they're your friends. Just like you think Amber is your friend, which story for another day. But Amanda's right. Amanda's right. Amanda's totally right here. I thought I thought there was a lot of glimpses of truth. Amanda was most on point mm-hmm. uh, through this. But she also, she confronts Corey and later Tori about their role in instigating. Yep. And I think Corey was totally right where he's like, listen, This is on Josh. Josh has to be a grown man and learn to control his emotions. Yeah. It's also, to Corey's point, it's on both Josh and Fessy for not burying the hatchet, like, earlier. I wholeheartedly agree with everything you just said. And it's funny because I'm going to tiptoe again because... (laughs) I've been saying this a lot lately in my regular life, but like Uh life isn't binary. Not everything is right or wrong. Two things are allowed to be correct at the same time. Right. And so when the conversation comes up in terms of, well, who's to blame for this and it's Tori and Corey's fault because they instigated the whole thing about the pizza and then they went to go get Josh, right. To get him to like yell and, and do what Josh does. All of that is true, but Corey is right. Like, Even if we did do all that, Josh could have stopped at any point. He didn't have to go that far, go that ham, and Fessy didn't have to react. So, yes, there is blame to go around from Tori and Corey, which keeps tripping me up because I'm Uh trying to bust rhymes. But still, Josh and Fessy, Corey's right, grown-ass men that at any point could have stopped, that at any point could have just like laughed it off. That at any point, 
you know, it wouldn't have been a thing. Yeah, they could have handled their business and just the it. They both should have said to themselves, shit, we have this dispute between us. We know it's going to be a club night, a party night. Mm -hmm. We need to settle this before we get drunk and do something yeah. that we'll both regret. Like they should, yeah. they should have known. I also think that Amanda was right because she takes on Tori about Tori instigating things. And Tori says, oh, I didn't think it was going to blow up this bad. And Amanda's like, you've met Josh. Like, you know what he's <laughs> going to do. And I have to agree with Amanda. Like, mm -hmm. and, and like, I appreciated Corey for... Wait, do, you, do you know what it is, though? Sorry, sorry. What? I'll let you finish. My bad. I, I got say, too excited. I, just, I got too excited. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that Corey basically owned it. It's like, yeah, I did instigate it. Josh should handle his business. Because... Tori should have taken the same stance because Amanda's done things like this too. Ashley, her best friend's done stuff like this too. Like it's just, it's part of the game. It's a strategy. Devin and Kyle have done this sort of thing. Like it's, it's a legitimate part of the challenge. It's on Josh and to lesser extent Fessy to like keep falling for it. Like stop being Charlie Brown with the football. <laughs> Do you know what the thing is to me for, for me, it's Corey's at least honest about his intentions. Tori seems kind of like disingenuous, like, oh, well, I didn't think they'd take it that far. It's like, no, no, no. Your goal was to have them do that, right? Like the reason why you stirred up this whole trouble wasn't just to be all, you know, to be entertained. It was because you knew what could possibly happen, right? And that is allowed to be true as well as what Corey said is also allowed to be true. Hey, that could have been our intentions, but those are two grown ass men that didn't have to yeah. follow through with what we wanted or what our plans were. That's on them. Nobody mm. forced them to do anything. I agree. Uh, the apology the next, was awkward. What did you think of the apology, man? The, uh, so there's two apologies. You're talking yeah. about the drunken apology the night of or the sober apology the next morning? The drunken one first. Like Josh is like bad crying on TV. And that's when you know you're that's when you know the Remy's in the system because like that's a bad cry right there. The one well, thing though that was interesting was Nani's also there crying and she's wiping away tears, but Josh has a full on ugly cry. And I gotta be honest, in that moment, I actually felt sorry for Josh. Yeah. Well, listener Julia Lamana says, all caps, not Josh crying over Fessy. And, and just like a bunch <laughs> of laughing and crying emojis. Okay. Okay. So, Sheldon, you know me. Mm -hmm. I'm of Scottish descent. Okay. And growing up, we had a, a saying in my family. I, and listeners, I don't think that this is actually a very healthy <laughs> expression but in my family we always said don't cry over anyone or anything that won't cry over you Ooh, i like that well i don't know that that's that healthy <laughs> if i'm being honest and i think my therapist would agree but yeah. that said josh is bawling his eyes at yeah. fessy that like fessy's definitely emotional but he's not crying like josh has cried and like that level of that imbalance of emotional investment josh yeah. should think about like when josh mm. is watching the season he should be thinking jesus christ like i was losing my mind over fessy and fessy was like pretty solid maybe i should put less stock in fessy Ooh. right Ooh, Ooh that's interesting that's I have more to say on the Josh and Fessy relationship. But first, okay. Let's talk about the Hot Sauce Committee Part Two. A little Beastie Boys reference? No? Um, we Sorry, have... I was distracted because I was checking Amanda's Twitter feed because I saw her going off earlier. And I just wanted to like cross reference <laughs> some things <laughs> that I was getting correct. Because she said, Tori is fake. Capital fake sorry two fakes second fake capital then the series the, then after in all caps says period <laughs> glad they showed me calling her out 100 
Hmm. But the thing that really co-signs what we were talking about, she says, I'm the face of face mush. I'm the, wow. I'm the queen of face mushing. So I'm honestly shocked that they sent him home. The challenge death has changed, which is more so what we were talking about, right? Just like how the vibe, like we've seen way worse than that on the challenge, right? Oh yeah. I think Nelson got sent home for face mushing. Uh, Derek, was it? Yep. But yeah. either way, sorry, we're talking about, as you said, this, this, the hot sauce crew. And I mean, so Emmy, which I still don't know how I really feel about Emmy. I still kind of find her annoying for whatever reason, but she's now with the crew of Tori and CT and Devin. And Emmy is talking about how she, her whole plan is she wants to steal CT. But the problem here is that Berna and Emmy had a conversation where Berna basically told her, hey, I don't want you to take C- take CT. And Emmy just straight up lied to her. Are you OK yeah. with the fact that Emmy just lied to Berna, like just straight up? I think Emmy plays sort of a sloppy game. Like, I thought she was really in the very first episode when she immediately threw the American survivors like Michaela and Michelle under the bus. But I also, she's sort of getting in this conversation, she's getting official approval for this move. And I know she did this after promising Berna. But she also probably knew that the writing was on the wall, that CT, Devin, Kyle, Tori, and Ed, who are apparently in alliance, mm-hmm. would be fine with her doing this. Mm-hmm. She also, maybe we're not giving Emmy enough credit. I mean, we've already seen Devin and Kyle talk about how it'd be good to get rid of Berna to help Nelson focus. So I think Emmy's reading things correctly. Um, so like, I think she kind of knows that she can screw over Berna with few repercussions. Yeah. And and if you look at that Alliance, they're pretty solid. Mm -hmm. Like, I think they would do well to protect her. And I would also note that like, she's been partners with Devin before. Mm -hmm. So she probably has some insight because of that. She also... You know, we've always been critical of Amber B's loyalty to Big Brother, the Big Brother Alliance, because they have a clear pecking order. I don't know who the pecking order is in this alliance. Like, Kyle and Devin are going to see each other through to the end. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, like, I don't know who's number one for who. And so, like, I feel like for Emmy, it's a situation where she could gain ground, you know? No, I got so, like, you. Makes I sense. Think it, I think it's a pretty good move. I don't know Makes that sense. her play style is sustainable. You clearly have some concerns about her immediately stabbing Burn in the back. No, I just think it's like, I mean, she said they're not friends. So at that point, it's like, all right, well, <laughs> what do you really owe her then? Right. It's kind of that simple. Um, I was just more so like, why even go through the charade then? With Berna, right? Well, Berna, Just because it's easier. Berna confronted her about it, right? Like she didn't ah, go okay. to Berna. Yeah, yeah. So maybe you're, yeah, you're caught off guard. What are you going to say in the moment? You're not going to like, because maybe you haven't figured it out, but also it's like, oh no, like, do I say it? Because maybe she'll freak out right now and you don't want that. So what's the point in having a freak out if you could go into the elimination and then lose, mm-hmm. right? Then she just freaked out on you for no reason. So no, that kind of makes sense. Kind of makes sense. Um, do we need to go over the Fessy and Josh making up bro yes, down? We actually do. I'm going to okay. be serious for a second here, Sheldon. I'm, <clears throat> I'm clearing my throat. So, you know, I mean, business. <laughs> Fessy and Josh are both idiots. Oh, like, and that's not news. Sheldon, like you and I have both been critical about of them for Mm -hmm. seasons, for years. Mm -hmm. But I will say in this scene, 
I was proud of them and happy to see them actually open up and I think very legitimately apologize to each other mm -hmm. and own their own feelings. And to be real, I think we live in a society where it's very hard for men to admit their own insecurities, especially to each other, especially in front of the camera, especially like Casey wasn't that far away. Like mm -hmm. I definitely had the sense she was listening in. So although I think they're both stupid and I don't like either, of them, I will, I think we have to acknowledge the fact that what they, a big part of their problem is something that a lot of men, especially men in their twenties have where they just can't say what they're feeling. And yeah. so like to that extent, like I applaud them for being, so open and like it's good to see and i think a lot of men have to do more of that they're also stupid just in general like they're not so bright. my thing is that they're actually genuinely friends and i think that part was yeah. important to like see shine through and I, i'll give them a lot of credit for that because i think that's like a really big part of this like them acknowledging you know the dynamic between them and josh at least is one big brother so he has that over fessy you know even though fessy might be the stronger competitor in this game josh does have the better social game than fessy in the house like it was kind of interesting to kind of see their dynamic and have them both understand the dynamic right but my thing too is i think they kind of knew that they messed up and oh, yeah. the thing that was really telling to me was the scenes of the house before tj showed up like, I don't know if that was great editing, great camera work that they were able to get all those shots from before TJ like actually showed up and just like edit them in to make it look like that. But those there are so many people that just looked shook. And <laughs> to me, it was weird because why did all of those people need to look shook? Like it doesn't affect you. And if anything, there's probably a lot of people that are happy that Fessy would be going home. No. Like, that's a part that was yeah. kind of weird to me that I didn't really understand. I was kind of thrown off by it. But I wonder what we didn't see. True. Like. Oh, yeah. Like, what else you, happened that night in the house? Yeah. Like, you know, when you were a kid and you'd have a supply teacher, a substitute teacher, and everyone would act up. Mm -hmm. And there's one or two kids that were really bad and you knew that they were going to be in trouble, but the entire class was going to get in trouble, too. Oh, yeah. I think that was the situation. So, like, everyone knows the three people, four people that are going to get in the most trouble. But I think they all know that they're going to get in some trouble. Right? No, and, like, fair. who knows if they're going to, like, have their alcohol privileges suspended, like, mm -hmm. maybe as a group, you know? I will say, this scene where everyone's looking so serious and so stressed out has my line of the episode. I didn't think this was a particularly funny episode. It was pretty good, but it wasn't very funny. Mm -hmm. Huey goes up to Josh and goes, you look really anxious, which is like <laughs> the most hilariously useless thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like, read the like, room, man. But also like, I, I almost have to think that Huey did it on purpose. Like that's like saying to someone about to make a presentation or to like speak in public, like, Hey, you're sweating a lot. Are you nervous? Like, it's, so, <laughs> it's not at all helpful. And it, <laughs> that really made me crack up. It's super strange, but that's Huey. Uh, it's funny. Cause my line of the episode is from this scene as well, but it's TJ saying, Fessy, you've been deactivated because the reason that's my line of the episodes, because I was actually stunned that this happened. I really? didn't think that Fessy would get kicked off the show because I just thought I've gotten so used to TJ's pump fakes all the time that I was like, oh, I'm not falling for this. He's going to say everything's good. This is your warning. Maybe they'll add something where like, you know, there's some hindrance to their next daily challenge or something or Maybe they'll implement the stupid big brother thing where you like you have to take cold showers. Like, I don't know what it is, but I didn't think that they would kick Fessy out. And I also found it. So Esther gets a warning. Josh gets a warning. And I mean, Josh got like 
he basically told him you were embarrassing everyone. You're embarrassing the cast, yourself, your family, all of which is true. But I was just like, wow, okay, all right, TJ. Um, but Fessy's reaction to me was weird. He didn't really have a reaction, which to me shows his memory of last season and how bad he looked in the final. Mm -hmm. Cause I feel like what happens on these reality shows, right? People know they're on the show, but there's moments where it clicks in and they're like, Oh, I can't show a reaction right now. Cause that's going to be a thing. So Fessy, he didn't get upset really. Meanwhile, you look around and like Amanda was crying. Josh was crying. Like people were still really shook and Fessy was just kind of like, Oh, it's okay. It's almost like he knew. It's almost like he knew. I hope that between last season and this season, Fessy really takes a look in the mirror and starts to examine how he is behaving. Because he has not come off well in either season. I think he did learn some lessons from last season. I'm not sure that he learned all the lessons, though. And I think he still has a lot more growing up to do, a lot more maturing to do. And yeah. I, I think this is certainly a learning opportunity for him and Josh. And I'll be interested to see how much he learns from it. Right? Like, it's yeah. one thing to have a learning opportunity. It's another thing to take advantage of that learning opportunity. No, for sure. For sure. And I think, you know, when I look at, this whole thing. And you think of how we talked at the start of the season about the Fessy rebrand and to then have it end like this kind of sucks, kind of sucks for Fessy. Um, but when I think about who's to blame, I think more so, you know what I really thought about somewhere Johnny bananas and Wes are really yeah. proud of Corey. Oh yeah. Right. Cause this is like a straight old school tactic where you're just trying to throw off someone else in the house, get them to like do something dumb and get kicked off. And it worked and it really didn't even take that much work for them to do. Right. Or sorry, it didn't even take that much of a reaction because all you're trying to do is get a reaction and think about how many times we've seen this with whether it was Johnny bananas or Wes or whoever trying to instigate and just push someone's buttons and get them to explode. And this didn't even take that much. But now one of the strongest competitors in the house is gone. And I mean, Corey definitely played a big role in it. The, he was the instigator. He fell into the trap, a trap that would only be more perfectly set by Johnny Bananas and Wes. The path to the finals just got a lot more clear for the men in the house. Yeah. Oh, a yeah. lot more clear. Notably, Fessy is only the second veteran to be eliminated this season. The first being Nam, or sorry, the mm -hmm. third, because Nam and Anissa both left with injuries. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. So we get to deliberations, to nominations, and they just got complicated. Um, yeah. I thought Kyle was cold-blooded in confessional when he said he's not at all upset to see Fessy go. No. Tori starts deliberations by apologizing so she'd understand if people are mad at her. And then Corey also takes some responsibility for the situation. Um, and then Devin and Nani say, you know what? We can apologize all day, but we, like, we have 20 minutes. We got to get this done. Let's yeah. move things forward. And I have to say, Devin, I know I'm the world's biggest Devin fan, but he's just <laughs> smashing it in these deliberations week after week, just controlling the narrative. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. though, like mm -hmm. he he is setting the pace and like he he's never been in the agency, but like he runs the show in the deliberations yeah. and does so in a way that doesn't put any heat on him, but is exposing everyone's games, is putting people on blast mm -hmm. for a little branding for you. Like yeah. every week he impresses me. Again, I know I'm biased, but man, just a master class in getting people to say the wrong things in front of everyone else. Uh, you mentioned the wrong thing. And here's what I still can't figure out about this season. People nominating themselves to go into the elimination. 
So Esther basically says that she wants to go in and I don't get it. Like you want to go in so that you can pick your partner, but that means you have to win. Like, I I just don't understand that. So Mm -hmm. Esther basically says that she wants to go in and everyone votes in Esther. And I think Esther was doing this on the assumption. Here's, here's Esther's biggest mistake, right? She's going in on the assumption that they're going to throw in another rookie against her, but she probably thought it was going to be like Bettina or she wanted the smoke with Amber, right? The problem is when given the opportunity to speak up in the deliberation, she says, oh, no, I'd rather keep that to myself. Bad move. That's where you messed up right there. If you put the person on blast in this situation and then they start going back and forth, everyone's riled up, everyone's into it, and you're getting what you want. Instead, you're leaving it up to them, which I get that it's Casey and, and, and uh, vampire dudes decision altogether. I understand that. But there'd be at least more pressure from the rest of the house to be like, nah, give the people what they want. Put in Amber. I agree with you that Esther blew it by not saying who she wants to partner with or who she wants to face. But I thought she made the fair argument that Josh's arguments on behalf of Amber wound up putting in his best friend. Like Josh, Josh always gets his priorities twisted and Esther just put it so beautifully. Mm -hmm. But at this mention, Amber gets oddly defensive, which to your point, like no one's buying what she's selling at this point. Like everyone's sort of like, all right, Amber. our guy Wes actually tweeted tonight that Ooh. Amber wouldn't be catching all this heat if uh, she hadn't won last season. Oh, yeah, I, true. I think that's true. I think that definitely makes it worse, but also Amber's not really reading the room. Amber's not a great political player. No. There's a lot of... She's, she is always trying to play the victim, always trying to give the sob story, trying to get people to feel sorry for her. There's a lot of that going on, and I I don't really understand it or why she thinks that works. Um, but to stick with this point, right, about people wanting to go into the elimination, this is what I don't get. Like, you want to go in to pick your partner, but the reality is that same partner can get taken from you the following week anyways. Yeah. So why not just avoid the elimination? Yeah. That's the part I don't get. Um, no, Sorry, I was on. just going to say, the other thing, though, is that Esther stands no chance because every man in the house is going to vote her in Mm -hmm. because it saves them. Yeah. Right. Like it guarantees that it's going to be uh, a woman's elimination. Yeah. And they're safe. So, I mean, no, it makes sense. What I have a question for you though. Sure. So should CT still trust Berna? He said he didn't. But should he still trust her? No. I don't think he should. First of all, she's clearly thrown her lot in with Nelson. Second of all, I don't know that's necessarily a matter of trust, but Berna's play style is not compatible with CT's. Because what CT does is he just hangs out and starts winning competitions when it counts yeah she is having a real hard time with the just hanging out part like yeah. if you're and like she she's a good competitor but if you're ct's partner especially in like the opening stages of a season all you have to do is try hard and listen to ct and that's it because he knows that yeah. he's out worst a uh, mini boss right like he's, <laughs> he's he's late in the game he yeah. knows it he knows that no one's going up against him he knows that he's protected by the veterans alliance and even then when they turn on each other he's not going to be the first target mm-hmm. so yeah. just hang out just work out try your best go to bed early hook up with nelson that's all there is that's all you gotta it's, do Berna. well it's something we talk about all the time right doing too much and she's oh, yeah. doing too much for to be CT's partner. 
You're totally right on that. I totally agree with you. Um, the one thing I, I don't know if I agree with that, like, what is Rage Cage? Wait, hold on. We got to talk about Emmy and Emmanuel's plan. Okay. Such as it is. So they're friends because mm-hmm. they're both Romanian. Yep. And, you know, they go to the same raves. And okay. he says to her that he and Casey are willing to put her in so she can pick her partner because she doesn't like being partnered with Huey. Mm-hmm. Emmy's nervous, but she hopes it's something physical because she thinks she can take Esther, but in a physical competition. And this plan, to me, makes some sense. But also, it's not even really a plan since, of course, the rookie rookie team is going in. Yeah. Am I am I wrong? Like it was there was a world. Yeah, but there was a world where they could have put in Amber. Like Casey clearly still doesn't really mess with Amber. Yeah. Right. And so if Emmy was like, oh, I don't want to go in and she's friends with um, vampire dude, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, Emmanuel. Um, there is a world where Amber could be the one going in. If Emmy didn't want to go in for whatever reason, I don't think anyone would have been mad, but I know what you're saying though. Like it is a long stretch to make when the assumption was that what was going to happen anyways. And if she didn't go in this week, then their, their uh, rookie rookie pairing would probably be going in the following week. Yeah. Before we get to the hall brawl and the elimination, the lair, I have, I have two comments, not about gameplay. First of all, your guy, Emmanuel, wearing a backwards visor, a black undershirt and sweatpants with flip flops. What do we what do we think of this look? I thought he looked like a member of Bram Stoker's LFO. Like what a you know strong what? look. I'm gonna take I'm gonna have a surprising take here where I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go at Emmanuel in this moment here. Reason being is You're scared of him. I understand. No, no, no. <laughs> we we've spent everyone has spent a lot of time in their house, in their houses, in their homes as of late. And I feel like it'd be a tough judgment for me to make to judge someone else's just chill attire, because I feel like I've caught myself in some very weird um, outfits, I'll say, while I'm just at home. And then you're scrambling because like a meeting's popping up or whatever. And like you're just in some random like home attire because you've just been at home every single day and not putting on normal everyday clothing. So I understand that my guy is on TV and he's on the challenge. I get that. But they are really just hanging out at home. I'm doing air quotes for people not watching. Do you know what I mean? So I'm not I'm, I just don't feel like I can be in a position where I'm going to crush someone else's um, home attire. OK, that's a fair point. As I look down at my pajama pants. <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to point out is before they go to the lair, there's a scene where Amber says to Jeremiah how nervous she is and they kiss. And I have to say, it says a lot about Jeremiah's skills and confessionals that his cuddle buddy this season is the center of all this drama. And yet he has had no confessionals in this episode. We did not see anything from jeremiah not a single like oh babe you're embarrassing me like not a single thing like we did aside from this scene where we like where he mutters we've seen nothing of jeremiah he must be yeah, I got horrible nothing. in confessionals i got nothing on jeremiah like literally nothing i don't know what he does i don't know what he says well i know what he does he's cuddling with amber and i'm not mad at him for that hey no i'm jealous i'd probably be pretty quiet in the background cuddling with Amber too all season. Not going to knock him for that. But every time my guy pops up on the screen, I'm always like, Oh yeah, that guy's here. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. It's all, so I, should got. We it's talk all about, I got on Jeremiah. I'm sorry. Should we talk about rage cage? Yes. Cause I'm all out on Jeremiah takes. <laughs> well, you can't have that many <laughs> beyond. He exists. Fair enough. Rage cage. So basically this is just hall brawl 
but instead of having to run all the way out of the tunnel to hit the bell, to ring the bell, once you get to the end of the tunnel, you have to climb up and ring the bell in the tunnel. Just, it's basically the same, just a little twist. Um, basically, you get to play Vega from Street Fighter. Sure, sure. Um, who did you think was going to win this? Was it pretty obvious that you thought Emmy would win? Because I thought so, Emmy would win too. Well, I thought, looking at this matchup, I thought that if I were Casey and uh, Emmanuel, I would put Amber in because Esther is lower to the ground. She's definitely shorter than Amber. Mm -hmm. And I believe that she's probably stronger. I guess Amber probably is so tall. Didn't she might we... not have to. No, Actually, hold on, I, hold on. Didn't we learn? Didn't Amber beat someone in Hall Brawl and we found out that she played rugby? But she Wasn't that played, a thing? She played like Amber M, who's like tiny. Remember, yeah. she she went against like a yes. complete non-athlete. So True, 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 true. Very correct. But the only reason I bring that up, though, is because we talk about it all the time. Esther said in her confessional, she's never even been in like a physical altercation at all, mm -hmm. ever. At least if you play rugby, you're not going to shy away from the contact. That's true. Right. And I think, I think that would give Amber a huge advantage, but at the end of the day, I mean, it was fairly an easy victory for Emmy. I mean, Esther did kind of fight and, and hold her ground. She was hanging on for dear life, but she was so far away from her end in the first round that I thought that she just wasted a lot of time and her energy to just lose the first round. And the second round, I mean, she just missed the bell. Which is heartbreaking. She would have had it, but she missed yeah. the bell. Yeah. Emmy wins, and she did it for her whole family in Romania. Uh, so I was annoyed with all the shouting, yeah. but then I loved it when Emmy said, I love the challenge. I also liked Esther in confessional say that she's not going to forget how Amber treated her until she has her pound of flesh. Yeah. Quoting Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice, which yeah. might be the most highbrow reference in challenge history. Yeah. I mean, I love how she was just like, don't cheer for me. Don't tell me good job. <laughs> right? I was like, whoa, you are so fake. I was like, okay, Esther. Esther's still cheesed at, at uh, Amber. So I find that interesting. Um, of course, Emmy picks Uncle CT. Mm -hmm. uh, I like what Kyle had to say. I don't blame Emmy. If I were down there, I'd want Uncle CT as well. And Berna is pissed. So she now is. Huey and Berna are partnered. And uh, Berna and Emmy are getting into it down in front of Mr. TJ. Oh, yeah. What did you think of this dispute? I mean, we've already sort of touched on it. but Yeah, I just think Berna clearly should have seen it coming. And the most interesting part to me, I guess, was... Her saying, well, I'm going to like you are now on my hit list, essentially, like I'm paraphrasing. That's not what she said, but essentially she wants to exact some form of revenge on Emmy, which to me is the wrong move because you're just giving the vets an excuse to keep throwing you guys in instead of trying to shift the focus to maybe some of the other vet women in the house. Um, I do want I have a. Listener comment, Renan Samarans says, <clears throat> literally right when Emmy started her little speech, the camera pans back to the rest of the competitors and bottom right screen, you can see Berna roll her eyes so goddamn hard at Emmy. Thought they were supposed to be buds. I had to rewind it twice. So Berna saw Not the writing buds. on the wall. Yeah. Not buds at all. Um, there's beef on this season. You know, and, mm -hmm. and that's that'll at least make things a little more interesting because I feel like there's genuine beef where people feel that they've been done wrong. And when that happens, people want their pound of flesh. 
The other thing that I thought was funny is Huey in Confessional thinks that Burn is a game changer for him. Broski, if you don't win next week, you're going in. Like, Burn is good, but she's not so good that the vets are going to turn on each other. I'm like, over Huey. Whatever, Huey. Get out of here. Yeah. So, we've done our lines of the episode. Who killed it for you this week? Oh, that's easy. It's Corey. Corey oh, wow. killed it in this episode. And the reason why Corey killed it in this episode is because if you go back, there are scenes where he has his arm around Josh, like he's egging him on. And it's not only the fact that he pulled the great manipulative move of just hyping up Josh to just get in Fessy's face, but also then Josh gets eliminated, but then he stands on it and says, yeah, we did that. But they're grown ass men like he could have stopped at any point. And I agree with Corey on every single level on everything that he said. And that completely altered the game. If you think about it, remember him and Nelson were coming back into this, trying to get their revenge on Fessy. It just didn't happen the way that people might have thought it did. It might not have happened the way that they would have plotted it out. But here it is. Fessy has gone home early. Corey and Nelson are still chilling. Um, I think for me, it's Emmy. Because you know what? She got her man. She got Uncle CT. Mm -hmm. She Not that she had any beef with Esther, but uh, she proved herself. Yeah. She got away from Huey, which is definitely a dub. It's always good. And, uh, you know, I think I think now that she has an alliance, I think she might survive. And I think she's linking up with CT at exactly the right time. Interesting. Because I think I think the veterans are going to turn on each other soon. And Mm -hmm. I don't think that it's going to really blow up in CT's face. I think he's pretty safe. I agree with that. I definitely agree with that. My thing is though, for from CT's point of view is he was just so worried about Berna doing too much. It's not like Emmy is going to like sit quietly. No. During the season. So I'm interested to see how that plays out. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, Where can the good people find you on social media? You can find me on Twitter at Shell Alexander, on Instagram at Sheldon Alexander. Check out our new project we got going on too with DRF Sports. We're doing football picks every week. We do that twice a week. You can find that wherever you get your podcasts. Um, you can find this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Like and subscribe to the YouTube page. We got lots going on. I'm almost as busy as my co host here, Mr. John Chidley Hill. Almost. I guess I am pretty busy. I was going to try to deny it, but I'm I'm a busy person. I wasn't uh, making a joke. I was making a serious <laughs> statement of fact. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at J Chidley Hill. Uh, and as Sheldon just alluded to, I work a lot. <laughs> and uh, my job is has been quite demanding these days, but I love it. So no complaints. And until next week, this was You Killed It. No complaints, because no one would listen anyways. You killed it. Boom, blast.